and welcome to tonight's edition of the Rural Doctors Programme. I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks for your company. Tonight, our programme focuses on immune deficiency. We'll also talk to the Bone Marrow Transplant Unit at Royal Perth Hospital about pre- and post-operative care for transplant patients. And we'll also talk briefly to last month's guest, haematologist Dr David Josky from Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, about responding to fever or infection in a neutropenic patient. But first, let's meet our studio panel for tonight. Dr. Olga Ward is seeing to other duties, so to host tonight's discussion, we're joined by Dr. Peter McGuire. Welcome back. Thank you, Jerry. Where have you been? We haven't seen you for a while. Oh, well, I'm, we're now working in Narogen, so it's a bit harder to get in to do this. But at least you look all the better for that fresh country air uh, down in Narogen. Absolutely. And uh, with him is clinical immunologist Professor Martin French from Royal Perth Hospital. Martin, thanks for joining us on the programme. You mean, Jerry? So, Peter, the topic of discussion is immune deficiency. Yes, Jerry, and I thought we'd start by asking Martin a bit about HIV, which is right. one of his areas of special interest. Um, as a rural GP, uh, I don't see very much HIV. I don't have any HIV patients that I know of. Um, what should we be looking for? How, how prevalent is it? Well, you're correct, Peter, in, say, in saying that it is not very common in the country, but it is important to recognise it when it uh, does uh, present to a doctor. And I think it, it's likely to present uh, in two ways. Uh, someone who's become acutely infected with HIV may present to their GP with an illness that uh, essentially looks like glandular fever, uh, but often it's uh, very severe and may have some atypical features, uh, for example, neurological disease, uh, uh, major uh, skin involvement, uh, genital mouth ulcers, etc. Mm. So I think if a, if a doctor sees someone with glandular fever that, that has unusual features, then they should suspect that this might be an acute presentation of HIV infection. What are the symptoms at the different stages? Uh, or are there different stages of HIV? There are, and um, so that, that's the, that's the uh, uh, stage of acute infection, which not everybody experiences, but, but a significant mm. number of people do. And then someone can have the infection for many, many years, you know, often 10 or 15 years, before they actually present with features of AIDS. So the, 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 the other uh, presentation that a general practitioner might see is someone who presents with what are called opportunistic infections, which are due to the immune system being so damaged by the HIV infection that the, 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 the immune system can't fight off infections. And common presentations to a general practitioner might be uh, uh, shingles, uh, uh, often uh, it may be severe shingles, mm -hmm. multidermatomal, but not necessarily. Often it can just be common or garden shingles. Um, there may be presentations with uh, uh, infections of the skin and the mucous membranes that are, are not unusual in themselves uh, in that, say, seborrheic dermatitis, which we see in mm -hmm. a lot of people. But if it's severe, if it's very protracted, then, then it makes you think of an underlying immune deficiency extensive warts, extensive mm. molluscum contagiosum, uh, fungal infections of the skin mm. and the nails that just don't uh, respond to treatment, it, 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 for example. And then, of course, there are the opportunistic infections of, of full-blown AIDS, uh, as a lot of people call it. And, uh, um, and people do sometimes present with, the, with an AIDS-defining illness as their first manifestation of HIV. They just have not known that they've had HIV. And the commonest one is, is, is pneumocystis pneumonitis. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, if a patient presents with a, a diffuse uh, pneumonitis, um, uh, then it's one of the things that should be included in the differential diagnosis. Can I just take you back to that? Glandular fever-like illness. Yeah. Does the blood count look like glandular fever, or is there are there clues there that, that this is not just glandular fever? No, it it, it really looks like glandular fever with uh, with uh, um, uh, a atypical lymphocytes mm. in in the um, in the peripheral blood film. I suppose one thing that uh, often is different is that the the monospot is is not usually it's negative. Big. That's something that's um, typical of glandular fever and the reason because uh, for that is because uh, the virus that causes glandular fever Epstein-Barr virus primarily infects B cells mm. 
and it stimulates B cells to produce various antibodies, including heterophile antibodies, which are, are the basis of the monospot mm. test. Whereas uh, HIV infection in the acute phase anyway, primarily infects T cells and, and depletes T cells. So you, you don't get the, the uh, antibody production mm. that gives rise to a, a, a monospot uh, a positive monospot test, but you will see uh, a lot of atypical lymphocytes in the peripheral blood film, just like glandular fever. Mm. Now, when, uh, as Peter says, he doesn't know if he's got any <laughs> HIV <laughs> patients. Yeah. He's, he probably doesn't. As we know, the numbers are relatively small. Do you think that doctors don't even think about this GPs when people present with some of these other symptoms, that they tend to look at that symptom as being something else rather than HIV? And how aware do you believe they should be of its possibility? I, I think that's correct, Jerry. I, I, you know, over many years, you know, I've been involved in the HIV field now for 25 years, so I've seen patients right from the early days when we were unable to treat it through to now where it's, a, it's a, a chronic manageable disease and very mm. easily treated and that's I suppose the main reason why doctors should be recognising it because we can treat it very effectively these days. But I, I have seen a number of patients over the years who've presented to their GP with chronic diarrhoea, um, uh, fungal infections in their fingernails or toenails that, that, that couldn't be treated properly and, and the, the uh, possibility of an immune deficiency was, was not considered. Mm. So I mm. think e even though it, it is uncommon, um, it, it should always be on a, on a GP's radar that, that it is around in our community. And in fact, the, the statistics from the health department show that rates of new diagnoses of HIV infection are continuing to climb. Hmm. So the last two or three years has been more and more have, infection. Yeah, I wonder, I'm just wondering, have we dropped our guard? And Peter, I'm interested to know from you as a GP practicing in the hmm. bush, if you actually have people coming to you and saying, look, I've either been taking drugs intravenously or I've had a dodgy encounter of a mm. sexual nature, shall we say, I need an AIDS test. Do you have people asking you for that? There are lots of people who ask for uh, an STI check for the sexually transmitted Cont uh, diseases, but they often they don't tend to ask HIV specifically. They tend and, and then when when the doctor suggests, well, and we usually do an HIV test as part of that, they're, they're quite happy to do it. Mm. But they won't, not as much as they used to. They won't ask yeah. for HIV specifically. I, don't, I think it's gone off out of the public awareness. And, and that's and that's an interesting yeah. point because Martin says the numbers are back on the increase again, which means maybe we've taken our eye off the ball, have we, in a public health yeah, aspect? I, I think we have. There there are a number of reasons why. A number of reasons why the the uh, uh, incidence is going up, uh, and uh, one is, as you say, that we've we it's not a, uh, a, a hot topic, a hot topic like it used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, when in the Grim Reaper that days, is, it's, yeah. it's just not like that any longer. Uh, but also, uh, we, we do see more cases uh, uh, f from uh, in people who've come to Australia from overseas. So, uh, sort of uh, migrants, uh, um, visitors to Australia, etc. So, so there are various reasons why the number of new cases has risen mm. recently. So, are the majority of new cases from any particular group? Is it is it the gay community, or is it the IV drug users, or is it people from overseas? Well, in, in Western Australia, we we are different to the rest of the country. For the last three or four years. Um, the majority of new cases have been amongst heterosexuals, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we do differ from the rest of the country. Why is that? Well, as I say, a lot of that is um, uh, it is migrants who've come here, some refugees who've come here from uh, African but countries. But don't they get screened for that before they come? I would have thought so. Uh, yeah. no, often yeah. refugees don't because yeah. they're refugees. Right, you know, yes. we, we, they, we they need, come with whatever they've got. We need to take them. Yes, uh, and, right. and then as part of their screen when they get here, we find they have HIV infection. Um, we, we have uh, 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 women from Southeast Asia, for example, who who uh, form relationships with men from Western Australia and then come here as partners, mm. then often they're not tested until they decide to uh, apply for residency at a later date. Mm. So there are various reasons. Uh, now you said earlier that it's now a chronic manageable disease, yeah, I think very, that's what you called it. Very mm. much so. So are people still dying of AIDS? Uh, occasionally, but unnecessarily. So whenever someone dies from AIDS, it's nearly always that they've not taken medication uh, properly for some reason. Mm. 
Mm. Sometimes they have uh, psychiatric or psychological problems, um, uh, social problems, whatever. But if someone is able to take medication regularly, there is no reason uh, for them to develop AIDS. Mm. Um, it, it, it is preventable. Well, that's a big change, isn't it? It's, it's a huge amazing. change, yeah. yeah. When I, I, I first came to Western Australia in 1986, uh, mm. quite a long time ago, and HIV infection then uh, could not be treated. It was a death sentence. At all. It was a death sentence, mm. yeah, essentially. Mm. Now, um, uh, people <coughs> don't need to die if they take treatments properly. There are very effective treatments. And also, you know, there are a lot of other positives, like uh, pregnancy. Um, um, you know, in Western Australia, we, we've not had a, a baby that's become infected for 20 years now. And, and that's because we, we manage pregnant women with HIV infection very carefully. Mm -hmm. And if that's done, and they're prescribed appropriate drugs, then the babies just don't become infected. Mm. Just, that's great. Just on the broader question of immune deficiency, AIDS is, as it says, acquired immune deficiency mm. syndrome. Um, <clears throat> what, what about natural deficiency, that which isn't acquired? What causes a deficiency in an immune system? Mostly it's, it's genetic. So um, there are a number of... Um, the, the immune system is a very complex system. I suppose like a lot of bodily systems, but the immune system is particularly complex because it's evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to, to deal with the many infections that we're exposed to. And, and so there are many um, uh, molecules and, and uh, uh, cells in, in the immune system that can go wrong. Lots of genes that uh, uh, encode for the proteins that uh, uh, are necessary for the functioning of the immune system. And um, there are several hundred uh, abnormalities recognized now where um, mutations occur in genes and, and that results in, in, in dysfunction of the immune system. Most of these uh, abnormalities uh, present uh, uh, in children. Um, but uh, a significant number uh, don't present until adult life. Um, and so general practitioners may see some somebody with a, with a primary immune deficiency. Mm -hmm. Can you support the immune system? Can you, can you nurture it? Can you keep it healthy? You can. Uh, it depends on the immune defect. Uh -huh. um, but the, the commonest... Um, uh, immune defects that we we see are, are uh, failure to produce antibodies for various reasons, but um, uh, people can't make antibodies against infections that usually uh, uh, affect their respiratory tract. Mm. And we can give immunoglobulin infusions uh, these days. So immunoglobulin is prepared from uh, plasma donated by blood donors. Um, it's very carefully screened and, and fractionated into the uh, uh, IgG fraction mm. and, uh, and that's administered to people um, and it's, it's very effective treatment if someone can't make their own antibodies done very commonly. So how common is that, Martin? Um, it's a, a significant problem. I mean, we, we throw, throughout Perth, we're probably, uh, I and my colleagues are probably managing 100, 150 patients with that sort of problem uh, throughout Perth. And uh, uh, that's adults, and, yes. and uh, there are children as well. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure that there are, there are people in the community who uh, have this sort of problem, uh, but it's not been recognized. So uh, mm. the sort of uh, problems then, that these mm. people have are repeated episodes of bronchitis and pneumonia, sinusitis, middle ear infections. Which are common. I mean, there are a lot of patients who, who, who do seem to have more infections than their fair share. Yeah. And, and many of them, some of them will ask, you know, could, could there be something wrong with my immune system? Yeah. And I guess if the numbers are in the hundreds statewide, then most of them presumably don't have a, a true defect. Um, how do we suspect the ones who do? Well, I think an important... Um, thing to do is to establish that a patient is is experiencing genuine infections. So there are a lot of people that are sent to me with a history that this patient has recurrent infections, please investigate. And when you actually go into their history, 
the infections are, are, are not really substantial infections. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I feel it's really important to establish uh, bronchitis or sinusitis radiologically or with cultures. If someone's having uh, two or three severe proven bacterial infections a year, there's something mm. wrong, mm. Um, and then you need to investigate them further. And I guess many of those would be smokers with chronic bronchitis or, mm. or people with asthma who, who are particularly prone or perhaps they've got undiagnosed bronchiectasis. Yeah. So you, need, you want us to sort of screen those ones out a yeah. bit, I guess. I mean, I think, I think that's an important point, that you do need to exclude uh, recognised causes of, of repeated um, bacterial infections in the respiratory tract, uh, like, like smoking. Yeah. What about repeated viral infections? Yeah, um, th there are immune deficiencies that uh, uh, make people susceptible to repeated viral infections, but in general, they're 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 pretty rare. Um, mm. you, you see children who mm. who uh, get repeated viral infections, and and it, it's really hard at times to know what is normal, you know, mm. it's just that they're being exposed to viral infections mm. by mixing with other children mm. and, 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 and what, whether it's... The it's normal hard. things that yeah, kids pick it, it's up. It's yeah. very hard to differentiate between yeah. that and, and something that really is truly uh, abnormal. Yeah. I, I think, I think uh, a clue can often be the severity, you know, if a child ends up in hospital with... Mm. Uh, with viral meningitis or something more than once, then you, 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 you know got something, it, you, something, something wrong. But, <clears throat> but mm. is, is there any sort of simple or straightforward test or series of tests that a GP could do that would give some indication as to the health of the immune system? The, 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 there are. So um, uh, basic screening tests would be to measure serum immunoglobulin levels. Um, and that gives you some idea about um, whether B cells are functioning normally, but it's not the. F it's important to stress it's not the full picture. Mm. So there are some people that can uh, fail to make antibodies adequately, even though they've got normal immunoglobulins. But it, it's a good start to, to mm. look at whether B cells are, are functioning normally. Um, the other thing you can do if if you suspect someone, a, a particularly child, has a immune deficiency is just measure a lymphocyte count because if if the child is deficient in T cells then the total lymphocyte count will be low. Mm. You, if the lymphocyte count is low then you can go on and actually request uh, lymphocyte subsets, TB, T cells and B cells and most laboratories, uh, public and private, would, would, would do that for you, measure T and B cells. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that's a, a, an easy way of screening. Mm -hmm. If you find an abnormality, then that child definitely needs further investigation. If it's normal, then it's uh, some reassurance. But if, if the history is still very suggestive, if the child is still repeatedly coming into you with infections mm -hmm. or going into hospital with infections, then they really need more sophisticated infections that can only really be done by a clinical immunologist. Do you see many of those kind of things, Peter, in your practice? Not, not really. Uh, not, not to the level that Martin's talking about. I, yeah. I think certainly some kids are sicker than others, and, and some kids have got mm. snotty noses all winter. But, but that's not really what we're talking about by the sound of it. It's, no. It's, it's kids who get. I mean, I, I can think <clears throat> of one child who had a number of repeated severe chest infections. Which were bacterial, and I yeah. guess that's uh, that, that, that may be a you know one to think about. Yeah, yeah. that 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 sort of presentation should uh, weigh, weigh flags that there might yeah. be something <clears throat> wrong with the way in which they're responding to bacteria. Is there any place for measuring the response to vaccines as a as a as a proxy for their? <laughs> the, the, there other is, function? and I mean, and that's that's what we uh, that's what we usually do um, in clinical practice. If if we if we're getting um, unclear uh, answers from just measuring immunoglobulins, then we will vaccinate um, children or adults and see if they can respond. One of the problems, though, is that um, the, 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 the data on what is a normal antibody mm. response is a bit soft. Generally, we would say that um, uh, you, you need to increase the amount of antibody at least twofold and, and probably fourfold for it to be a, a normal antibody response. And, and, and how long does the effect of a vaccination last, Martin? Um, 
It, it depends on the vaccine, but there's, there's a lot of data now to show that um, uh, some vaccines, uh, uh, their, their effect can persist for, for a lifetime. So uh, once only and you're right again. You need a full course of vaccination. Right. So um, you know, when, you, when you first vaccinate somebody, you, you prime the immune system and then you need to go back and boost mm. to get a, a full generation of what we call a, a memory immune response. But um, yeah, there's been some very interesting studies done <coughs> recently in the UK where they've, they've looked at um, antibody responses to smallpox. Now, we, we haven't used smallpox vaccines for, mm, for a long years, time, yeah. long mm -hmm. time. But if you, if you look at people who were vaccinated years ago, you can find um, uh, memory B cells that will respond to smallpox wow. vaccination, okay. a smallpox vaccine. Now, as Peter knows, I'm a fan sometimes of alternative therapies and I just want to ask you this as we go to the break uh, there are some products on the market that, that are called things like immune support which are supposed to help you yeah. fight off colds the onset of colds or flus or whatever it's called immune support is there anything to suggest that they work I don't, I don't know of any scientifically valid data that uh, indicates that they do work now I can't say that they don't work because I don't know that anyone's ever done any any good trials mm. to, to determine whether they do or not. Maybe it's the placebo. Maybe we went with right. the <laughs> Maybe that's right. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the placebo. <laughs> is there, really? If it works, all right. We might leave the discussion there for the moment. Now, in last month's broadcast on hematology, you'll remember we spoke to Dr. David Josky from Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. Well, while he was here at the studio, we asked him about patients with neutropenia and what a rural GP's response should be to a neutropenic patient presenting with fever or infection. David, sometimes country, um, country patients come back to their home between chemo cycles, and they'll often be quite neutropenic, obviously, between their chemo. Um, if they present to us with a fever, what would you suggest that we do? Straight to hospital. Straight to hospital in Perth, like we don't um, try and treat it or blood culture it or use the antibiotics that we've got available in the country? Uh, start antibiotics anyway, mm -hmm. but get them on the way, uh, pure and simple. Okay, so, so blood culture, most broad spectrum thing we've gotten in the plane, yeah? Pretty much, yeah. Um, we recognise febrile neutropenia, particularly after chemo is an emergency. Um, there's a significant mortality associated with it and, and our rule is that all patients should have received a dose of broad spectrum antibiotics within four hours of the onset of fever. Mm -hmm. What sort of broad spectrum antibiotic would you um, suggest out of the armamentarium that we don't have in a country hospital? Well there's a huge literature on what's the best antibiotic and the literature says combinations, single agent, big arguments. We currently just use tassacin. Uh, um, as a single agent. Um, two years ago we used Tementin and Gentamicin as a double agent. So we're, we have the luxury of being guided by our own micro results on mm -hmm. our patients. So we would normally have things like perhaps Keftriaxone and Gentamicin, is that a reasonable sort of combination? That's reasonable, yeah. yeah. And that'll cover our main, mainstream gram negatives and gram positives? Yeah, a lot of chemo patients will have a line in. Yeah. Um, there's a few things to say about febrile neutropenia. Um, the first is that it is an emergency. Yep. Um, so even amongst our patients in the metropolitan area, in, in my sort of last 10 years, in my department we've had two patients die mm -hmm. um, after cycles of chemotherapy at home because they felt they didn't need to come in. Um, and that, that's of course a tragedy. Um, to get bugs in the system when you haven't got white cells to fight it is the problem, obviously. Yeah. Because there are no white cells, the usual localising signs and symptoms of infection might be lacking. So there might well be a lung infection, but consolidation can't happen because there's no white cells to make pus. Yeah. Similarly, if there's an infection in skin, there might be um, erythema and cellulitis, but there won't be the classical organising sort of signs. So, so they could have an infection, say, in their peak line, but we might not actually know. Absolutely, yeah. Um, there is neutropenia and there's neutropenia. The normal range is two to four for neutrophils. Yep. The real risk of severe sepsis probably cuts in below about 1.0 yep. for neutrophils. So sometimes, for example, I've had GPs call with patients that we have in common mm 
where they are a bit neutropenic, particularly after chemo for Hodgkin's in young women. Neutrophil 1.2, I'm not actually so worried about that and would be prepared perhaps to just give oral ciprofloxacin or something like that, which is hard to prescribe and outside the hospital setting, mm -hmm. I know. Um, so once a patient develops a fever and they're genuinely neutropenic after chemo, then in, in town at least they're told, check your temperature half an hour later. If it's still up, come to hospital. Yep. How febrile? 38. 38. Um, I should also mention I'm referred quite a few patients with idiopathic chronic neutropenia mm -hmm. around the 1 to 1.5 mark with the other blood counts normal. Yep. Um, most of those patients, in my experience, don't turn out to have anything much. Yep. Some of them have autoimmune diatheses, particularly lupus, is probably the commonest one. Um, some of those patients, if you chase it hard enough, and in particular do the bone marrow biopsy, you'll turn up myelodysplastic syndrome of a mild and early sort, uh, but you wouldn't give them any treatment. And on that basis, I'll discuss it with the patients that are referred and say, look, we can do a bone marrow and it might prove this, but if we found it, we wouldn't do anything. And they usually agree with me and say, let's not do the bone marrow yeah. unless the neutrophil count worsens. So I'll usually refer the patient back to the referring GP at that point saying, keep a watch on the neutrophil count. Um, so we'd screen that every three months or every six months or every year? About three or four times a year, yep. Um, the screening tests that, that are worth doing before you consider referring a patient on, yep. uh, make sure that the blood film and the rest of the blood counts are normal. Yep. Joski's law again. Yep. Um, Check the hematinics. They don't generally affect the white cells, and there's no dietary way to manipulate people's white cell counts so or platelets. So the B12s and folates. Yep, still worth doing. Now, about 10% of patients with um, B12 deficiency can have a lowish white cell count. For example, um, it's worth doing an autoantibody screen, anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-nuclear factor, rheumatoid factor, yep. um, looking for the lupus type entities, and the other common cause that should be screened for the the chronic virus infections, particularly Hep B and C, yep. classic cause, and HIV in a high risk group. Professor David Josky there, and we'd like to thank him for once again being involved in this month's program. So back to our discussion. Uh, Peter, you wanted to ask about support for GPs. Uh, particularly in the HIV area, um, but, uh, I know it's been said that people expected HIV to become a problem in the Aboriginal communities and it hasn't. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on why that is? Well, I think uh, there's been very good management in the, in the state that uh, there, there has been HIV infection in some Aboriginal communities. It's been detected uh, quickly and uh, we, we've put in uh, support programs uh, and prevention programs. And that, and that I think, uh, to a large degree has prevented it from becoming a, a, a major problem amongst the Aboriginal community. In fact, if you, if you look at um, uh, prevalence rates, they're about the same in the Aboriginal community as in the non-Aboriginal mm. community. So, so it, it hasn't spread into the, in the Aboriginal community uh, as people uh, were worried about. No, that's mm. true. And to take up Jerry's point about support for, yeah. for, uh, for GPs who need some advice from, from you. I hear you've got a new unit or a new Well, it's, it's not a new unit. For, it's for, for about 15 years now, we, we've had a, um, a service at Royal Perth Hospital, uh, which we called our rural and remote um, immunology service. We call it an immunology service because people don't like it to be called an mm. HIV service. But yes. essentially, we do manage uh, just patients with HIV infection. Uh, and we, we have a, a, a nurse manager at Royal Perth Hospital who manages the service. And uh, she liaises uh, with doctors at Royal Perth and with general practitioners uh, in rural and remote areas and with nurses as well in, in, in some areas. And so we can um, assist in the management of people with HIV infection throughout the state. Mm. Um, uh, we, we do this by uh, email, we do it by uh, teleconferencing and we also do run some clinics as well. So we, we run a, a clinic in the Midwest and in uh, Kalgoorlie and we're planning to, to start one in Broome soon. So we've got a, there's a lot of services that we offer and, it, and it, in a state like Western Australia, which is so big, it's very important because we can't, 
expect patients to be flying down here all the time sure. to, to have their HIV assessed. Mm, mm. And so what we, what we try to do <clears throat> is to identify a general practitioner, sometimes a general physician in a, in a town um, and s develop, set up a relationship with them so that the patient sees that doctor mm. and then the doctor liaises with us about the, the best uh, way to manage the, the patient. So, and is it irrespective of the normal hospital affiliations, is it Royal Perth based for the whole state? Or? It, it is at the moment, right. yeah. Right. Uh, Fremantle Hospital does, uh, they, they have a, a similar but much smaller unit that uh, looks after a few patients in the southwest. Mm. Um, but the, the, the main unit is, is at Royal Perth Hospital. Mm. One of the things that G rural GPs particularly appreciate is the ability to be able to pick up the phone and mm. call a number and get some advice. Yeah. Presumably you can offer this We do of? that, yeah. yeah. So it, there's, there's always um, a specialist at Royal Perth, uh, either a clinical immunologist or an infectious disease physician. Mm. Uh, we, we run the service together. There's always someone who will be able to give advice um, um, over the phone. Or, or through teleconferencing. We, mm. We've done that a number of times. Just run us through some of the issues that, that you find are co-managed with GPs out there. What sort of things with HIV patients do you, do you find are the, well, the problems? Uh, at, at the moment, the, the main problems are um, uh, managing antiretroviral therapy. Mm. Um, so as I said to you that HIV is now a chronic manageable disease with the use of antiretroviral therapy. But some of the drugs do have uh, uh, long-term toxicity. Mm. Um, some of them can cause uh, renal disease. Uh, uh, some can cause hyperlipidemia, for example. So we, we, uh, we, 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 we need to, to monitor patients mm. very carefully for these adverse effects of antiretroviral drugs. The, the other thing, uh, from the point of view of an immunologist, is that we, we realize now that um, HIV infection, as well as damaging the immune system, does lead to a chronic state of activation of the immune system, and that leads to inflammation. Mm. And even when you suppress the infection as, as, as well as we can, there still is residual inflammation and immune activation. It's sort of one of my research uh, interests. And, and we do know that uh, that can increase a person's risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So it's very similar, say, in, in lupus and rheumatoid mm. arthritis, that um, it's well recognized now that those patients are more at risk of developing atherosclerotic vascular disease and cardiovascular disease and having heart attacks. And that's because they've got a state of chronic immune activation and inflammation. And, and it's known now that, that that can also happen in HIV infection, uh, even when you've got the infection as, as well suppressed as, as, mm. as it's achievable now. So is that <coughs> standard cardiovascular prevention stuff that we're talking That's about? That's right. There? So mm. these, you know, I, uh, so 25 years ago I was dealing with all these horrible infections that people were getting. Now I'm telling them not to smoke yes. and to lose weight and <laughs> <laughs> checking their blood pressure and things uh, like that. Yes. Uh, on the question of the, the antiretrovirals that are now available, when, when AIDS first struck there was nothing. It was a death sentence. Now, as you say, it's manageable. But is there continuing research on the drug front for, for new ways to, to, to manage this? Yes, there is. Um, and I was um, at the uh, International AIDS Conference in Vienna just uh, uh, five weeks ago and um, uh, th th there are always presentations on, on new uh, forms of drug therapy. Um, at the moment, we haven't got any drugs that are more effective in controlling the infection mm. than the ones that are currently used, but the newer drugs that are coming along are, are either safer, they've got fewer side effects, or they're more convenient mm. for patients. So uh, now we are able to deliver three drugs uh, in one tablet once a day. So when I first started treating people with HIV infection, they were taking you know, 20 tablets a day sometimes mm, and having mm. to take them four or five times a day. Now people can take one tablet once, once a day, day and that suppresses the infection fully. Is that, is that taking the interest out of vaccination or are we still looking for oh, no. an AIDS vaccine? There's a huge amount of interest oh. in, in, uh, yeah. in vaccination. Um, um, for, for two reasons. One would be obviously it would be a way of, uh, of preventing people from becoming infected but there's also the hope that if you can uh, 
vaccinate people who have already have the infection, mm. you can boost immune responses that um, will, will, will control the infection without drugs. Um, there's a lot of interest now in uh, people that are called uh, controllers or elite controllers. So about one in a hundred people with HIV infection uh, never need treatment. Mm -hmm. They can control the infection. They have very low levels of virus in their blood uh, and that go can go on for 10 or 15 years and they never need treatment. So there's a big international research effort at the moment to try and find out what's different about yeah. those people. Well, what, what about lifestyle factors in the management of, of HIV? How big a factor are they, one way or another? Well, as I say, uh, the, the, these days we, we are very um, keen on, on educating people about avoiding uh, vascular disease, mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease, because of this underlying state of inflammation. So we're very strong on mm. stopping smoking, on exercise, on low-fat diets, mm. uh, make it, making sure you're not hypertensive, th those sorts of things. So we, we do educate people a lot now about their lifestyle if they've got treated HIV infection. And maintaining a level of physical fitness, making sure your body's as fit as it can be, is that important? Like, you know, when you talk about physical exercise, are you talking about above and beyond what somebody who doesn't have an infection would do? Not really. I think what we're talking about is the, is the uh, common advice that's given to the general community Good about... clean living. Uh, yeah, about <laughs> avoiding, avoiding cardiovascular disease. Yeah. So, you know, walk for 30... What is it now, mm. Peter, walking 30 minutes <laughs> 30 a day minutes, and, uh, yeah. you know, those sorts yeah. of things. I mean, yes. uh, and yeah. a couple of glasses of red wine, which yeah. you know, <laughs> prescribe. Yeah. Peter. But certainly that was prevalent in the old days, that, you know, the HIV patients were told to give up give up alcohol and, yeah. you know, live very clean and did lots of fruit and veg and no meat and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You're not quite as strong on that no, these not, days because the drugs work. really. The, the, the drugs work mm. uh, and, um, and the, as I say, the, the, the main... Uh, risk of, of, of having chronic treated HIV infection is cardiovascular disease. That's what we focus on. But we don't make people's lives miserable by <laughs> saying you should never drink. That's yeah. very reassuring. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the, 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 one of the groups that, uh, that is particularly difficult to, to manage are the patients who've got HIV infection and hepatitis C infection. Yes. And we do have probably about 10% of our clinic at Royal Perth are people who've got both infections. Mm. Uh, hepatitis C is usually acquired from intravenous drug use, but um, increasingly now and, and, and around the world, um, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of mini epidemic of hepatitis C infection amongst gay men with HIV. So mm. a, lot of, a lot of gay men who have got uh, well-controlled HIV infection are, are exposing themselves to other viruses and, and, and it, there's now data to show that uh, they, 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 they are picking up hepatitis C infection mm. um, through sexual activity. And, and when you've got both infections, it does become a bit more difficult to manage. Mm. Um, um, and, but, but really important to address the hepatitis C infection because um, there's lots of data now to show that even though opportunistic infections are, are much less and uh, are not killing people with HIV infection. If they've got a hepatitis C as well, then they, they, they will develop uh, a cirrhosis and they will develop uh, hepatocellular carcinoma mm. and it happens more, much more quickly in people with, hepat mm. with HIV yeah. infection. So you, you, you do need to, to look at those people uh, 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 and devise particular treatment programs for both virus infections. Mm. You know, we've learned so much over the past 25 or so years since the, since AIDS first presented itself. We've learned a lot about how people acquire AIDS or, 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 or how they become infected or whatever. Are we still using those lessons and applying those lessons? Can we look to what might be the next AIDS, if there is such a thing? Um. I, I think uh, if, as far as HIV and, and hepatitis C, et cetera, go, so the, the message really is that you, uh, if you're going to have multiple sexual partners or if you're going to share needles, you've just got to be as careful 
as you can. You, I mean, that, that's the message, mm. and I think a lot of people have lost that message. Um, what will be the next uh, the HIV? Uh, yeah. um, I don't really know. I mean, the press do their best to try and beat up yes. every infection they can, <laughs> you know, from SARS through to, uh, what about to Ebola swine virus? flu and Ebola virus. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, but, uh, what's happened with Ebola virus? That's gone out of the news lately. Well, I heard on the radio today, actually, that there's some American scientists who've uh, developed a drug that seems to have an effect on, on Ebola virus. So research uh, is, is, uh, is, is the key to, to these unusual infections. And, but, and, and yeah, but you wouldn't see much of that down there, Not way. a lot. No, <laughs> definitely not a lot down no, there, that's for sure. No, that's for sure. I've never seen it. I've never seen Ebola. Mm. Just a slightly left field one that Jerry mentioned earlier. Is there any evidence that environmental toxins are damaging people's immune systems? You know, you read it in the press that insecticides or heavy metals or something or the cause factories. of everything. Yeah. yeah, I mean, is there, have you seen any evidence that there is any basis to that? Uh, essentially, no. Um, yeah. There there have been, uh, as you know, over the years, many people have advocated that uh, environmental toxins may damage the immune system. And, of course, there are some sort of heavy metal sure. poisonings, mm. etc., that can... can uh, really damage your immune system, but for the general population who are, who are not e exposed to uh, clearly toxic levels, I, I, I don't know of any good evidence mm. that toxins do uh, uh, damage your immune system and cause immune deficiency, no. I mean, I'm thinking in particular now about, about the Kimberley, where there's going to be a gas hub, processing gas coming mm. in from, from offshore. Uh, who knows what sort of uh, illnesses may be attendant upon that. And our farmers who see lots of pesticides and herbicides Correct. and things, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 there, there are always worries about these things, but I think we just need to reassure our patients that at the moment there's no well-proven uh, mm. uh, form of immune deficiency that's due to environmental toxins. Now, when we talk about the environment, and a lot of our doctors work in, in Aboriginal communities where you know, living standards are third world level. Mm. Uh, hygiene is mm. is uh, is not really mm. present. Are there any uh, um, immune deficiency connections with that kind of lifestyle? Well, cer certainly, uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, children are more susceptible to certain mm. types of infections, you know, middle ear infections and other infections, and and and. Um, it's always been difficult to know how much of that is just related to the environment and how much is perhaps um, some sort of, a, of immune defect that they've acquired. And, and uh, I, I don't know that there's, that there's, a, there's a, a, a very good answer to that question. I think mostly it is environmental. Um, mm. You know, there's data to show that if you take measures to prevent the children from getting middle ear infections, whatever, then... Mm. then like uh, putting a swimming pool in. <laughs> like putting a swimming pool <laughs> yes, in, yeah, yeah example. Yeah. You, you can prevent it. So uh, I, I think mo most of it probably is in, environmental. Mm. Yeah. Of course, there's the other side to that coin, isn't there? There's a bit of suggestion that we're too obsessed with killing every bacterium in the environment and that we're actually too clean. Yeah, and uh, this is one of the things that turns a lot of immunologists on these days. Yep. And, uh, mm. and uh, you know, there's even a name for it, the sort of the hygiene hypothesis of autoimmune and, and allergic disease. So the, the hypothesis that some immunologists have is that the immune system has evolved uh, to cope with uh, infections, uh, to deal with the, the dirt so that we, our ancestors found themselves in, that, that, that un underprivileged mm -hmm. people in the world today find themselves in, and, and that the immune system, that's what it's there for. Mm. Uh, and that these days people are so obsessive about keeping their house clean that the immune system uh, is, 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 is uh, ex experiencing ab an abnormal situation. And that may be the reason why we're seeing more uh, uh, allergic, allergic disease, disease and yeah. some yeah. autoimmune diseases and even diabetes. You know, yeah. there's a lot of immunologists who, who think that, that we, we are too clean, too clean. these yeah. days. Mm. Can I just ask quickly about immunosuppressant drugs? I guess that's the other thing that as a GP you, that, mm. that we see in terms of immune systems, that people's, people are taking things that suppress their immune system. Um, are there any sort of messages about how to manage those those patients when they present with infections or 
well, the sort I think, of things we might look for? I think you, you have to be um, more vigilant about infections in people who are on immunosuppressant drugs, and I imagine most people are, are aware of that. Um, treat uh, infections promptly, and, um, uh, and maybe uh, if, if someone does turn up with, a, with a, an aggressive or an unusual infection, a, a very simple thing to do is just to measure their lymphocyte count, because mm -hmm. I, I've seen a, a lot of people now who've turned up with uh, pneumonia or, 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 or some very severe infection, and, and you find they're extremely lymphopenic, and it's pretty clear that the, uh, the immune suppressant therapy has, uh, has uh, really made them very lymphopenic. Um, uh, one, one, one bit of advice I, I would give to general practitioners is to just to review patients who are on immunosuppressant therapy to make sure that they're being actively managed by somebody. Someone. Yes. Yes. Um, because I've seen people who've been started on drugs like cyclophosphamide, um, maybe for a severe vasculitis or vagueness syndrome, and th they've been left on those drugs for years and no one's been really actively mm. managing them. And, and drugs like cyclophosphamide can cause uh, severe damage to the immune system if, if someone stays on, on the drug for a long time. And, and in fact, uh, most uh, immunologists and rheumatologists these days would uh, only use cyclophosphamide for about six months, maybe nine months, uh, and try and convert a patient to another immunosuppressant if possible to avoid those sort of long-term side effects on uh, 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 long-term effects on the immune system so I think a GP can r review patients and just make sure that their immunosuppressants are being actively managed by somebody well, that's yeah. good advice so yeah. Yeah. and that's where we might leave time. it thank you for that Martin well finally tonight we go to Royal Perth Hospital and we take a look at the bone marrow transplant unit we uh, spoke to them about pre- and post-operative care for transplant patients, including the role of the GP in the ongoing management of patients who have returned to the bush. In Western Australia each year, we do about 110 to 120 bone marrow transplants. Uh, there's two types of bone marrow transplants. Uh, in broad terms, one is called an autologous bone marrow transplant and the other is called an allogeneic bone marrow transplant. Well, an autologous transplant is where the recipient of the transplant also acts as the donor for the transplant. An allogeneic transplant is where the donor is a different individual. For autologous transplants where the patient acts as their own donor, the commonest uh, indications are multiple myeloma and leukaemia. With allogeneic bone marrow transplant where uh, a, a relative or unrelated donor is acting as the um, uh, marrow donor, uh, then the commonest indication would be leukaemia uh, related disorders. There is a smaller group of bone marrow failure syndromes uh, which are not malignant conditions and other genetic diseases uh, such as thalassemia uh, and sickle cell anemia for which bone marrow transplant is also undertaken. So both the disease and the transplant are going to impose specific requirements for care for the patient. For example, um, autologous bone marrow transplantation where patients use their own tissues uh, is a much easier procedure for the uh, patient to undergo. This is because the graft comes from the patient's own body and we don't have to worry about the problem of um, graft rejection uh, or, or the graft interacting with the patient in a negative way. So patients having transplants using their own tissues have a high dose of chemotherapy. Uh, the bone marrow cells are then reinfused, and um, after about two weeks the graft starts to grow. Uh, because of the high dose of chemotherapy given prior to the transplant, um, the patient will be ill for several weeks with mostly uh, gastrointestinal toxicity. Uh, but once they recover from that and the graft is growing and the blood counts rise again, um, the gut usually heals and the patient makes a, a gradual recovery over the next four to six weeks. Uh, in that time, the patient will be tired, um, uh, they will probably be quite anorexic, so encouraging patients to eat is um, 
uh, quite important. Um, but after six to eight weeks, they will uh, usually taste improves and patients' uh, physical stamina and energy starts to improve. And um, certainly within three months, most patients are back to normal. Uh, the <coughs> allogeneic bone marrow transplant is a much more complex procedure. So in this procedure, um, prior to the transplant, the patient has a usually high-dose chemotherapy, sometimes chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Uh, this high-dose treatment uh, is quite toxic to the patient. Um, it's intended really to eliminate any residual uh, malignant disease, usually leukaemia. Uh, it's also intended to suppress the patient's immune system so that the graft is not rejected because the graft is coming from um, a tissue matched but a different individual. And uh, to prevent, and in fact rejection is a relatively uncommon phenomenon, so it's uncommon for the donor's immune system to reject the graft. But what is more common is that the graft uh, or the graft's immune system will recognise that it's in a new environment and can make the patient ill after the transplant with a disease called graft versus host disease. And to try and prevent that, patients are on immune suppressant drugs after the bone marrow transplant. And these are generally drugs like cyclosporin or that class of drugs, and sometimes drugs like prednisolone as well. There's two forms of graft versus host disease. There's an early form called acute graft versus host disease. Acute graft versus host disease tends to affect skin, gut, and liver. Uh, in the skin, the manifestations are often rash. Um, in the liver, it often causes a hepatitic picture with uh, cold, some cholestasis and elevation of the bilirubin. And in the gut, it will often cause nausea uh, and diarrhea. Uh, chronic graft versus host disease is a a slightly different illness and it uh, looks a bit more like scleroderma. Uh, it will often cause a keratoconjunctivitis sicca syndrome, so a common problem for patients is dry, sore eyes, um, dry mouth with mouth ulceration. Uh, in addition, it can target other structures in the gut and so um, um, ulceration of the esophagus and or diarrhea are not uncommon. Uh, liver dysfunction is not uncommon um, and uh, other, other organs can also be targeted. Skin changes are not uncommon, a bit like scleroderma. So you can see skin thickening that looks for all the world like scleroderma in some patients. We keep them under very regular review um, during the period of risk for graft versus host disease and many rural patients will be travelling to the city once a week uh, to see us for us to monitor graft versus host disease. The clinical manifestations and laboratory monitoring are complex. The requirements are quite complex. We need to monitor drug assays. Um, associated with intensive in immunosuppression is the risk of viral replication. So these patients, particularly for cytomegalovirus, so these patients are often having viral load testing. Um, and if the patients previously had hepatitis, we'd be monitoring uh, hepatitis uh, viral loads as well. So a lot of the uh, follow-up for these patients is managed from uh, our specialty, specialist centres such as PMH and Royal Perth Hospital. Um, should patients develop um, exacerbations of graft versus host disease between visits, and this might be symptoms such as nausea and vomiting, uh, diarrhoea, uh, worsening rash, um, uh, then the GP would be best to contact us and we would advise about what to do. Some patients, acute graft versus host disease is severe enough to warrant admission to hospital uh, for further immunosuppression. There is a risk of infection after bone marrow transplantation. Um, the the um, level of the risk does depend a lot on uh, the complexity of the transplant and how robust immune reconstitution is after the transplant. Um, neutrophil engraftment after allogeneic transplants is usually fairly prompt within two to three weeks. So most patients have relatively good infection against bacterial pathogens uh, fairly early, but nevertheless, occasionally patients will develop bacterial infection and will require uh, antibiotic therapy.
Uh, and you can even see very late after transplant pneumococcal sepsis and every couple of years we will see a patient 10 or 15 years down the track who will develop pneumococcal infection. Uh, so um, in some patients uh, we will have patients on um, a prophylactic penicillin but it is quite difficult to get patients to comply with very long term prophylactic penicillin. Um, certainly we have a vaccination program uh, which includes Pneumovax um, and revaccination with childhood vaccinations early after transplantation. Probably a bigger problem for most patients is the risk of uh, atypical infections and viral reactivation and that includes organisms such as CMV in patients who've, who are CMV seropositive or have had CMV seropositive donors. Hepatitis B can be a problem for the occasional patient who's been exposed to Hep B in the past. Uh, zoster is not, a, not at all uncommon and GPs may well be the first person to encounter zoster and this should be treated uh, as one nor would normally treat zoster uh, in any patient. Uh, a common concern for many patients is um, what to do should one of their family become un unwell with uh, an upper respiratory tract infection as happens uh, every year in, in um, our community. As best patients can, they should try and isolate themselves uh, from um, family and friends who've got respiratory infections, but it's not always possible if, if the patient is a carer uh, for their children to be able to do that. Our experience by and large is that the transplant patients usually are no more unwell than, than uh, the rest of the family and can usually be treated in exactly the same way. We probably have a lower threshold for intervening with antibiotics, even if we're pretty confident that it's, it's viral infection. But by and large, um, standard viral infections don't seem to cause an enormous problem. Uh, but as I said, we have a lower threshold for intervening with antibiotics. Uh, just occasionally, you will see outbreaks of respiratory syncytial virus um, in uh, transplant units. And so a patient who um, has very young children um, who become unwell with respiratory infections are a little bit more cautious in that situation. Uh, occasionally we will see uh, other atypical organisms like pneumocystis uh, causing problems but most of our patients are on prophylaxis for pneumocystis and by and large that's pretty effective in preventing um, infection. I think the patient that the GP really needs to be aware of is the patient who is heavily immunosuppressed and by that I mean the patient who's not only on cyclosporin and atacrolimus but those who have got active graft versus host disease and are on large doses of steroids. These are the patients that really do have more exotic infections, including viral reactivation, um, pneumocystis, fungal infection, uh, and can, can develop quite formant infection and become rapidly unwell. And the best thing in, in that situation, if there is a patient who's heavily immunosuppressed, who becomes unwell with infection, is to get them up to uh, rural Perth as quickly as they can. Well, that's about all we have time for tonight. Uh, before we go, Martin, any final thoughts for our uh, bush doctors? <laughs> well, Jerry, I think uh, I would encourage doctors to always consider immune deficiency disease of some sort when they see a patient with uh, uh, either repeated infections or abnormal infections. Um, in terms of HIV, uh, if they uh, are wanting any further advice about investigations, management, help with a patient with established infection, then they could always contact our unit at Royal Perth Hospital. So we have a, a rural and remote uh, uh, immunology unit uh, in, the, in the Department of Clinical Immunology at Royal Perth Hospital and they can access the nurse manager by phoning the Department of Clinical Immunology. And that's the number and that will also be on our website. Martin, thanks for being with us tonight. Okay, thank you. And uh, remember, if you want to review this program or any of our previous programs, you can do so on our website at ruralhealthwest.com.au where you'll find all of our programs going back to 2008. We're back again on the 5th of October with the program 
that will focus on wound management. Peter, good to have you back again. It's been a pleasure. Richard. And you certainly seem to be enjoying Narogen. That's great. It's good. On behalf of the team here, Jerry Gannon saying thank you for joining us.